ما بهوت هی کوش هی کوش <تصفيق> من بهوت هی کوش هو کی آج موه یهان امانتریت کیا گایه هی <تصفيق> I, I know, of course, that over the years, the Supreme Court of India has manifested an interest in the work of the International Court of Justice. Unlike many other constitutions, the, Australian, the Indian Constitution acknowledges the role of international law in uh, Article 51, part of the Directive Principles of State Policy. And uh, the Supreme Court of India has, of course, regularly referred to international law and indeed on occasions to decisions of the International Court of Justice. Indeed, I've been struck uh, that it appears much more open to invoking international law than other apex courts, such as my own, uh, the High Court of Australia or the United States Supreme Court. But what I, I would like to do today is to start with describing the history and structure of the International Court of Justice. And then I, I want to discuss how it navigates its role as a legal institution in deeply divided political environments that implicate questions of judicial independence. Of course, the International Court of Justice's structure and jurisdiction are quite different to those of a national court, such as the Supreme Court of India, but I hope that you will find nevertheless that some of our experiences resonate with you. Well, the origins of the court, and this is our, our modern court building today, Uh, date back to the early part of the 20th century. And you can see here an image of the Hague Peace Conference, of the participants at the Hague Peace Conference of 1899, gathered on the steps of what's now the royal residence, the House Ten Bosch, just outside the Hague. So there were two Hague Peace Conferences, 1899 and 1907, both uh, strikingly initiated by Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. And those two conferences together resulted in the establishment of an institutional structure for international arbitration. And this is the permanent court of arbitration, which is still going strong today. Uh, but an arbitral court is not a judicial institution. And there were moves in the early 20th century to create an international judicial tribunal. But these uh, ideas only came to fruition after the First World War. And indeed, the covenant of the League of Nations of 1919 precisely envisaged the establishment of what was called a permanent court of international justice. And this permanent court was housed in the same building, the Peace Palace, or uh, in The Hague. And I've, I've got, this is a picture here of the uh, inauguration of that building. And perhaps in the front with the white beard, you can see the funder of the Peace Palace, the Scottish-American philanthropist Andrew Carnegie uh, on the opening day. So the first occupant was uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, but it was then forced to provide half of the building for the Permanent Court of International Justice. So the Permanent Court was inaugurated in 1922, and indeed in that year it dealt with three requests for advisory opinions that had come from the Council of the League of Nations. In its life, between 1923 and 1940, the Permanent Court delivered judgments in 29 cases uh, between states, and it rendered 27 advisory opinions. And its last public sitting was in 1939, just after the outbreak of the Second World War. And this is an image of the formerly the last meeting of the Permanent Court of International Justice, which took place because of the war, because of that time, of course, the Netherlands was occupied. Uh, this is the image of the court, as it were, disbanding itself in 1945. I should say some of those judges immediately became judges of the successor court, the International Court of Justice. So the new court, the International Court of Justice, which was established under the Charter of the United Nations, had, we inherited a statute almost identical to that of the permanent court and adopted remarkably similar rules of procedure. And even today, uh, our court operates under rules of procedure, many of which uh, were first devised in 1922. 
Uh, the International Court, however, distinct from the Permanent Court of International Justice, was elevated to the status of a principal organ of the United Nations, uh, institutionally on the same level as the UN Security Council and the General Assembly. Well, as for our structure, that this I should say this is the first, this is the opening of the International Court of Justice, the first hearing, and perhaps in the front row of the audience you can see the then young uh, Crown Princess Juliana of the Netherlands, who went on to be, uh, of course, a long-standing Queen of the Netherlands. And you can see the, the inaugural judges gathered round the, um, the, the table there. Well, this is the latest, what we call the family photo. I should say that the court, uh, we had a new composition starting just on Tuesday. So this is the court in its composition as of last Monday. But as of Tuesday, of course, we, we lost four of our colleagues, including our, our president, Judge Joan Donoghue, and our vice president, Judge Kirill Gavorgin. But this shows you uh, the, the one photo I could find of all the judges, uh, all the old composition of the court uh, together. So the court is composed of 15 judges who are required to be of different nationalities. And judges are elected by the United Nations General Assembly and the United Nations Security Council voting simultaneously. And judges are elected for nine year terms, which are renewable. The court's statute, and I quote from it, mandates representation of the main forms of civilization and of the principal legal systems of the world in the court as a whole. And how that's translated in practice is that requirement is observed in an informal regional allocation of the 15 seats. There has also been a tradition that the five permanent members of the Security Council always have a national on the court. This was so until six years ago uh, when uh, the United Kingdom famously, I think I don't need to remind yeah, Indians uh, lost its, its seat on the court, and in the most recent judicial elections in November last year, uh, Russia, as it were, lost its, its seat on the court. So there are three now, three permanent members of the Security Council uh, still have judges on the court. So we can't really refer to that as a long-standing tradition anymore. The statute doesn't refer to gender representation, unlike, for example, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And I think overall the International Court of Justice has a poor record uh, in attention to gender balance. In almost eight decades, just six women have been elected to the court, while 109 men have been elected at the same time. Today, uh, with uh, our President Joan Donoghue has been uh, the new American judge, uh, Professor Sarah Cleveland, has joined us. So uh, we are still four women and 11 men. Uh, you will be aware that a former member of the Supreme Court of India, Judge Dalvia Bandari, we, we call him judge at the court. I'm aware that he would be justice here, but he's Judge Bandari at the moment is a current member of the court. Other distinguished judges from India include B. N. Rao, one of the architects, I need not tell you, of the Indian Constitution. He was elected to the court in late 1951, but sadly died uh, before he even completed two years in office. Uh, perhaps the longest serving Indian jurist that we've had on the court is Judge Nagendra Singh, who sat on the court for 15 years. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, and he also served as the court's vice president and then president. And as president, he presided over perhaps one of the most significant cases in the court's history, the Nicaragua case, and I'll, I'll come back to that case. Um, every day I walk past this statue of uh, Nagendra Singh, Judge Nagendra Singh, because if you're president at the court, you are allowed to choose either a sculpture or a portrait. And so uh, the sculptures are displayed in the judge's wings. So I, I feel, although of course I never knew him, but I feel um, I see uh, Judge Nagendra Singh uh, every day with this uh, splendid, splendid bronze portrait. Another Indian judge on the court, uh, Raghunandan Swarup Patak, who was uh, appointed when he, uh, he was elected to the court when he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he finished Nagendra Singh. Oh. Uh, after uh, Nagendra Singh's death in 1988. The court inev invariably sits with all of its 15 members. Uh, 
the statute of the court, it's true, contemplates the formation of specialist chambers to hear particular cases. But that course has, surprising to me, it's been very, very rarely invoked. It's at the discretion of parties to call on the court to constitute a smaller bench. So almost invariably, we sit in the composition of all 15 judges. If there's no judge of the nationality of a state party to a dispute on the bench, that state may appoint a judge ad hoc for that case. So in some cases, we have 16 or even 17 judges. In three out of the six cases involving India during the court's eight decades, there was no Indian judge already on the bench, and so various distinguished Indian jurists were appointed as judges ad hoc. So one was uh, the former Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, M.C. Chagla, who was ad hoc judge in the rights of passage case, uh, the case uh, brought by Portugal against India in the late 1950s. Uh, judge Nagendra Singh, uh, he was also, before his election to the bench, he served as judge ad hoc in a case India brought against Pakistan relating to the jurisdiction of the IKO Council. And Supreme Court Justice BP Jeevan Reddy was uh, appointed ad hoc judge in a case that Pakistan brought against India, the aerial incident of the 10th of August 1999. So that's the membership of the court. What about jurisdiction? In its contentious jurisdiction, the court deals only with disputes between states. So unlike the International Criminal Court, uh, we never see individuals as such in the court. They are never... Uh, before us as individuals in the court. All 193 members of the United Nations are automatically parties to the court statute, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they accept the court's jurisdiction. There was some discussion whether the court should have compulsory jurisdiction during the drafting of the UN Charter at the San Francisco Conference in 1945. And that position, the court having compulsory jurisdiction, was certainly a champion by smaller states, such as Australia and New Zealand. But ultimately, the view of the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom prevailed, and that was that jurisdiction should be voluntary, and that's the situation today. So there are three distinct ways by which cases can come before the court. First of all, it's possible for states to enter into a special agreement to submit a dispute to the court. And we have a nice example of one such case currently on our docket, and this is where the Caribbean coast neighbours of uh, Guatemala and Belize have agreed to submit a territorial dispute to the court. So that's one route, and that's in fact the easiest route because one knows there will be no challenges to jurisdiction or admissibility. But a second route is when both states are parties to a treaty that grants the court jurisdiction to decide disputes between treaty parties. And uh, examples of such treaties that have such a jurisdictional clause include the Genocide Convention, and of course it was precisely Article 9 of the Genocide Convention that was invoked by South Africa in its recent case against Israel. Uh, there is the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination that also has a jurisdictional cause, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention Against Torture. 